Good. Um, my name is Orville Schell, and I'm going to be wrangling this discussion with uh, my friend uh, Peter Schwartz from Salesforce. Uh, so let me just quickly introduce uh, who we have here. Um, we have uh, Jeffrey Rosen, who is the deputy chairman at Lazard, who is back and forth between New York and Europe. Um, uh, we have Ann Harrison, who's the dean at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and Matthew Slaughter, who's the dean of the Tuck uh, School of Business at, at Dartmouth. Um, so what we're going to do is start off quickly with Peter and I just giving a few comments about what it is that we're discussing. What's the, what's the problem? And then uh, our colleagues will uh, weigh in for about seven minutes each, and we'll have a discussion amongst us for a while. And then we want to throw it open to uh, questions to you all uh, for a good half hour at the end. So I think, you, you know, I went for 10 years to the World Economic Forum when its topic was almost exclusively, exclusively the uh, sort of halcyon promise of globalization. Now there was hardly a dark cloud in the sky. It was both the inevitable, ineluctable dynamic in the world, and it was considered uh, public good for all comers. And that is really now, I think, at an at a incredibly important inflection point. And the whole global order, uh, particularly the global economic order, trade order, uh, I think are poised for some very, a very big transformation. And in many ways, that transformation is driven by a very unexpected uh, rise of authoritarianism around the world. You all remember Francis Fukuyama's uh, very optimistic view of the end of history. And we've now sort of had the end of the end of history. And strangely, we find ourselves on the, the sort of the downside of a very uh, unpredicted, uh, unforeseen cycle where uh, liberal democracies, which were once perceived to be uh, sort of uh, inevitably triumphant, are now being challenged. So what's happening in Turkey and Poland and Hungary and Philippines with Duterte, and particularly, of course, in Russia with Putin and in China uh, with Xi Jinping. And I think of the major catalyst of this moment of this inflection point uh, is China. And why is that so? Because China is pioneering, even as it sort of touts itself as a global trader, it's also pioneering the refutalization of the global economy. If you look at what China's done with the internet, for instance, it's almost a metaphor for the kind of, of uh, uh, sequestering and re-sovereignization uh, of the internet uh, that's characteristic of, of its, act, its sort of attitude in many other realms of life. And what are they doing? They basically are saying there's no such thing as the World Wide Web for us. We have an intranet. There are gateways into China, which are all controlled and packet sniffed. And, and uh, in other words, their intranet is a sovereign space. So the notion of intranet sovereignty is an aspect of a whole other idea of no interference in the internal affairs of another country. But that sort of amplifies itself in myriad other ways, which uh, uh, we can talk about in, in greater detail as we go on. And so this undermines the fundamental notion of globalization. It also brings into the whole uh, equation something that David started out talking about uh, in discussing Adam Smith and his kind of bipolarity of the invisible hand on the one hand and moral sympathies, uh, uh, moral sentiments, empathy on the other hand. The Chinese model, which now has been lofted as an alternative to the chaotic, sometimes dysfunctional, uh, uh, liberal democratic model is a model that is fundamentally without uh, moral sentiment. It is without uh, uh, sort of all the, li the niceties of liberal, liberal uh, democratic uh, uh, rule of law. 
you all know the, the litany of this. So in a certain sense, we are seeing, sadly, a kind of a clash of civilizations that is being manifested most obviously in the trade war. I just got back from Korea. Uh, as you know, Donald Trump showed up and crossed the DMZ and, and, and had a meeting with Xi Jinping, and that's a whole other can of worms. But needless to say, uh, there are going to be some big changes uh, in how this sort of global fabric uh, stays woven together. More and more in Washington, you hear about decoupling. Decoupling supply chains, decoupling sectors of the economy, and of course the key sort of fulcrum is more and more high tech. Because high tech feeds in to this whole idea of surveillance, social credit, facial recognition, AI, I mean, this whole host of things that's growing out of the new, the new technologies that are now uh, coming online. And this creates a, a, an infinitely stronger form of authoritarianism than I think even some, someone like George Orwell could have imagined in his worst nightmare. And so that's where we are today. Two very different systems, very different values, very different uh, uh, interests. Uh, and we are trying to figure out what kinds of angles of repose this liberal democratic world order that was set up after World War II, how do we find a comfortable uh, uh, relationship with this new world of authoritarianism, particularly in China's case, because it's so large and there's has such, such a vast amount of capital. Uh, how do we, uh, what's post-engagement engagement supposed to look like? We have absolutely no idea. So Peter, let me turn it over to you for a few thoughts, and then uh, I think we'll uh, just start with you, Anne, and maybe go to you, Jeffrey, and Matthew, let you that clean up. Right. Uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you to David both for having me here. I'm not an economist. Uh, I'm an engineer, uh, I'm an astronautical engineer, but a good friend and neighbor. Uh, but these issues that we're debating here have concerned me a long time. Uh, I, I've sat at the head of, as head of strategy of uh, Royal Dutch Shell and now at Salesforce, uh, global companies uh, trying to operate in very different kind of environments. Uh, I also had the very unhappy experience of uh, reading Neil Ferguson's book, The War of the World, and then debating Neil on the subject. Because uh, Neil, has a very dark view of the uh, history of the last 70 years and the meaning of globalization, the meaning of the global order, and so on. And he and I debated it. And sadly, uh, events are proving him more right than me. Uh, uh, that is that uh, his view, and not mine to begin with, but as I said, history seems to be shaping along his lines rather than mine, was that that post-World War view order was simply a tool for the United States and with a bit of help from Britain to contain the Soviet Union. That all the institutions that we built, the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, the BIS, well BIS came before World War II, but uh, NATO, etc., were simply the tools of a new form of global imperialism by the English-speaking world to assure a stable world order. Uh, and it worked for quite a long time. And then as China rose, it began to break down, and in his view, this would lead inevitably to conflict. Uh, and here we are. Uh, and unfortunately, Neil seems to be righter than me. Uh, and uh, I find this very painful, because obviously not just simply being wrong, but uh, that order produced peace and prosperity, relative peace and prosperity. Uh, if you think about the pre-World War, or the World War II environment and before, 180 million people died in war. And while it is a large number, only 20 million people have died in conflict since World War II. Now that's a terrible number, but it represents a rather profound uh, gain. You look at prosperity pre-World War II and the spread of prosperity post-World War II. So for me, this all seemed to be, in a sense, the lovely expression of the Enlightenment in a higher order, bringing in the moral values, the economic values, uh, and the growth and prosperity of society. And now that is breaking down. And if Neil's right, then in some sense, there's no way back. It is not a matter of restoring order. I also wrote a paper, uh, I helped start something called Wired Magazine in the 1990s. And I wrote a cover story in Wired that got a lot of attention called The Long Boom. 
1997, in which I argued that innovation and globalization were the routes toward spreading and growing global prosperity. Well, I was wrong again, uh, because clearly globalization has broken down, uh, and we are now fragmenting and not globalizing. And so uh, for me, there is a really basic question here, and that is, is the system that we have built actually one built on the kind of moral sentiments of Adam Smith with a higher sense of virtue, with a sense of shared purpose, uh, a, a sense of inclusion? We heard uh, inclusive capitalism talked about by Linda Rothschild a few moments ago. Can capitalism be inclusive and actually take everyone with us? or? Is it simply a narrow definition of self-interest? Now, I, I work for a company that tries to balance both of these, i.e. Salesforce, getting that social interest right, as well as economic interest. We have managed to deliver both for our shareholders and our stakeholders uh, rather well. So I think it is possible. But having said that, I think there's a really fundamental challenge to that idea that is now being uh, uh, put forward by China. I, I have uh, had the privilege of going to Davos every year for the last 27 years, and like uh, Orville, uh, saw uh, much of that discussion. But there were two moments that were kind of uh, really rather profoundly different in the last couple of years, and that was when Xi Jinping came and spoke uh, two years ago, uh, I guess now three years ago, and talked about a new global order with China as a leader, and that they were now the rightful keepers of a new global order and that they were now emerging from 500 years of somnolescence uh, and constraint by uh, uh, imperialism and Maoism to now take a rightful place in the world and as the greatest country and greatest empire in human history. Uh, the following year, Donald Trump came and said, uh, we're open for business. Uh, and uh, that was about all he had to say. Uh, and that there was no statement about U.S. leadership, U.S. leadership in the role, the, our, our values, democracy, any of those questions of human rights that America had stood for for at least the post-World War II era. And so we saw a rather dramatic contrast between an inward-looking retreat and an outward-looking new vision, not necessarily a globalist vision in any sense that we have thought about it before, but a vision shaped by essentially authoritarian leadership, a hierarchy of an imperial dominance of China, uh, and a new kind of vision of a radically different global order. And I think that is the choice that we're seeing, is, is this, are we headed toward a world that is fragmenting with a few poles of order? China, Europe, maybe, and it's a big maybe still, Russia, what role it will play, and whether the United States will play any role beyond its narrow self-interest. Uh, and I mean, he, Trump arrived in Japan and said, ah, the Japanese alliance, well, we don't really need that anymore, and tearing up one more behind him. So what we find ourselves in is in this world of enormous uncertainty, taking radical uncertainty as a view. There are only several possible scenarios. I do scenario planning, and one scenario is that this is a temporary aberration the world gets its act in some ways together. Leadership emerges of the right sort, great leadership, America, China, Europe, of the sort that we saw post-World War II and can knit together a new fabric of collaboration. Or we are headed toward a world of increasing fragmentation and conflict. And if that's the case, then the fundamental question is, does that conflict lead to World War III? And I think that is the biggest uncertainty that sits behind all this. Is this a path toward war or is this a path toward a new global order. So uh, the question, it seems to me, uh, that we want to address here is what part of the old order, the globalized marketplace, the global institutions that we've set up, do we want to save and can be saved? And if they can't be saved, as Peter suggests, then where does it leave us? I mean, how do you decouple the two biggest economies of the world who've just spent, since 1972 when Nixon and Kissinger went to China, you know, converging. How do we, how do we get divorced? Should we get divorced? Can we divorce partially? What do you do with a company like Huawei? Britain, right now, is having a big debate. What do you do with Huawei? That's because it's, it's already started to put in some uh, Huawei platforms and, and, and Huawei systems 
And Huawei has given Britain, as you all know, if you're from Britain, some laboratories to make sure they don't have back doors. But back doors are not the only, only threat here. The threat really is what happens when they just turn the lights out, when there are no more spare parts, when they just don't want to service anything. When we go to war, if we go to war, what are you going to do with a bunch of systems you got from China? How are they going to function? How are they going to operate? Is that a good idea? Is it possible to winnow out the good from the bad and keep the trade relationship going? So now, Anne, uh, seven minutes. And I will ask everybody to try to be very uh, uh, strict and uh, haiku-like in your, your remarks here. Sorry, you're going to have to cut me off because I have a lot to say. Um, Discipline yes. yourself. OK. Um, first of all, uh, I'm the dean of Berkeley Haas, which actually some of you may not know. In Berkeley, California, it was actually founded by a woman over 100 years ago. And if you look at the mission statement of Berkeley's business school, it states very clearly that it was founded facing towards Asia. So it was already imagining that this world that we're seeing today would exist over 100 years ago. Um, and I think that's a fitting kind of uh, preamble to my remarks. First, I really want to uh, thank my colleague, um, David Tease, for inviting me to this very impressive uh, gathering. And, and I really want to emphasize how important it is to think about our public policies and our economic activities with an eye towards creating more prosperity. Um, I am, in fact, an economist. In fact, worse than that, both of us here are actually trade economists. So we have a lot to say about what's going on. Um, and in fact, I've also done a lot of work on inequality. And I'd like to emphasize four points, um, some of which I may not have a chance to go through all the way. First, I'd like to say that this pain that's associated with rising inequality that we see in the US, all over the world, within countries, it's very real. It's, it's not a myth. People are really being hurt. Um, second thing I would like to say is it's very tempting to blame China. But none of the evidence supports, in fact, if you look at the evidence carefully, that China is to blame for what's going on within all our countries. Um, that's a really important point, because somehow I feel like I'm not reading the same newspapers or talking to the same people as, um, as many other individuals right now in the United States. Um, so what is to blame? If you look at the data, the biggest driver of what we're seeing in terms of job losses and rising inequality is actually technological change and automation. So I was in Seattle two weeks ago talking to Microsoft and Amazon. And I went into an Amazon Go store, and you don't ever need to talk to a person in an Amazon Go store. You walk in, you take things you need off the shelves. The cameras record what you bought. You leave the store. No people are involved. This has nothing to do with China. Okay? This is called automation and technology. That's what's leading to the loss of jobs. And then the fourth point I want to make is that what we really need to address this, so everyone's analyzed it, including the US president, what we really need are the correct public policies, which are not tariffs. Um, so I don't know how much of this I'm going to be able to get through. Um, let me start by saying the pain is real. Uh, in the US, in 50 years ago, one in four jobs were manufacturing jobs. Now it's one in 10 jobs. My own research has shown that if you take a worker and that worker is moved from a manufacturing job to a service job, you can actually follow the same individual over time, that worker will lose 20% of their wage. Their wage will go down. So manufacturing jobs are really good jobs. The US now has the highest level of inequality it's had in 100 years. If you take the, um, all the, the actual data that creates measures of inequality across countries, you can actually see which are the most unequal countries in the world. The US is the most unequal industrial society in the world. It's topped only by 
four or five countries, all of whom are emerging markets, South Africa, China, India, Colombia, Mexico, and Brazil. The difference there is that in a country like China or India, poverty has declined dramatically. The number of poor has been cut in half. Inequality is either stable or starting to diminish. In the US, if anything, inequality is continuing to rise. With that inequality has come political polarization. If you then analyze the voting records of what happened with Brexit, I'm happy to hear that Scotland was a remain, but if you look at the voting records in England or if you look at the voting records in the United States, you can actually track what caused the polarization both on the right and on the left. The people who voted for the more radical candidates were those who were more hit by import competition, in particular competition from low wage countries. So what we see is we do have this increase in political polarization, which has in fact been contributed to by trade, okay? But, and this is really important, why people voted for or against Brexit and what's actually causing them to be worse off are totally different things. So let's get back to my, um, that was my first point, that the pain is real. My second point is that it's not China. China is a scapegoat, just as 30 years ago, Japan was a scapegoat. How do I know this? We now have literally hundreds, if not thousands of studies trying to understand what has happened to US manufacturing jobs and whether it can be linked to China. And the evidence is pretty conclusive. At most, at most, this is the high end, China can account for maybe a quarter of the job losses that we're seeing in the United States. That's by the most famous study. But even that research has been attacked by a lot of other people showing that even that 25% is too high. And it, it's easy to, I mean, I could get into the details, but I can't do that now. Maybe somebody will ask me a question. But just think about, just think about the data, okay? U.S. manufacturing employment has steadily declined since the early 1960s. China did not become a player on the global stage until 1978, okay? It's not China. It's definitely something else. So what is that something else? That gets me to my third point. What's really causing this reduction in employment in the US and in other OECD countries, and even in China, is automation. What we see going on in all these countries is that the share of employment in manufacturing and declining, it's already started declining in China, by the way, so this is a universal fact. Here's an interesting other fact. The share of manufacturing in US GDP has been the same for the last 50 years. It's 12% in real terms. Jobs have changed, so how can that be? How can our manufacturing share stay constant but the number of jobs decline? It's because we're becoming more productive. We're replacing people with machines, okay? The machines are winning, right? So last point I wanna make. I've given you a view of the world which is somewhat different than my other colleagues on the stage, so that's good. That's Berkeley's role, right? Um, and the question is, and this is a question that's really tripping everybody up, which is what do we do about this, okay? So my students would ask me when I was a Wharton professor became a, before I became the Berkeley Dean, so if, what should we do? The right policies are definitely not tariffs. What are tariffs going to do? They're simply making matters worse. We have evidence. What's happening is that now, the trade is coming from Vietnam instead of China. Now what's happening is that we've created this massive rush for China to industrialize even faster than it was before. We're basically cutting off our nose to spite our face. Um, so what do you do? You compensate the losers. That's the most important thing. As a trade economist, we somehow forgot that there were winners and losers. It's in our textbooks. But we just remembered that the net gains were positive and we forgot to compensate all the losers. Huge mistake. That was our biggest, you and I, yep. mistake. Um, and we need to compensate them. We have to invest in human capital. We have to invest in infrastructure. Half of the people who are eligible for trade adjustment assistance don't take it. We need to fix that. 
We need to give universal access to social services, education, health care. We could even go more extreme. If tinkering isn't the answer, what's a more extreme measure? Basic universal income. Andrew Young on the stage in the Democratic debates suggested that. Bill Gates has suggested that. Andy Atkinson has suggested that. But I guarantee you that a return to protectionism is only going to make things worse for everybody. So when we lose all our taxi drivers because of driverless cars, and we lose all our journalists because AI has taught machines to write our newspaper articles for us, we will realize how radical a solution that we need in order to address this major revolution. But attacking China is definitely not the right solution. It may not be the right solution, but apparently it's the easy solution <laughs> yeah, uh, right. because <laughs> it's out there and it's easy to challenge. Uh, I would iterate a couple of points that have been made already. I think it's not a problem of China. I think it is a question of automation, or to me, it's broader than that. It's technological disruption. And if you look at countries, and if you look at companies, and if you look at societies, I think what is affecting them profoundly and will affect them even more profoundly in the future is the consequence and the risk of technological disruption. A lot of what is behind China's strategy for 2025 and the emphasis that the president of China has placed on uh, developing um, their, an internal innovation capability that expresses itself in end markets of products is a recognition that unless they get on top of technological disruption, they, <coughs> they risk treading water or falling behind, curiously enough. And it's a force that I think, it's a factor that I think takes into account uh, the demographics of China over the next 50 to 75 years, which if you study them, you'll find are in fact deteriorating rather than improving on a number of different levels. Uh, so that's the first point I'd make. Uh, the second thing is um, I still am, uh, I believe, uh, pendulum swing. So what we're seeing now, I don't think, is a trend that just continues on forever. Something will bring it back to a different equilibrium. Um, Harry Broadman makes the point to me that pendulums swing not in two directions, but in multiple dimensions. So I'm not quite sure where it ends up in the next swing. Uh, but to some extent, I think a lot of the factors that concern us today will be to some degree self-correcting and some degree correcting by virtue of some of the measures that you recommended that I think are starting to become more popularly accepted as means of dealing with these factors. Uh, the human capital factor. Uh, if all we did in the United States was put a greater emphasis on the quality of education, and let's call it the uh, diversity of education, the need to educate people to cope with changing technology as well as to uh, create dignity around different types of jobs, not just the jobs that get the most visibility. That alone, as a public policy measure, I think would go a long way towards dealing with a number of the issues uh, that we're talking about here. Um, finally, I, I think that um, uh, the challenge uh, that I think we now have to recognize for the next 10 to 20 years and longer uh, back to technological disruption that will have an influence on globalization, which parenthetically, I think globalization is hard to break down. The international institutions that govern the rules-based liberal order may have started to falter in their ability to do so. But at a practical level, corporations are so embedded in the notion of globalization, by which I mean manufacturing, distributing, and selling their products globally in order to provide prosperity for all the people that work for them, starting with the people at the very top, as well as their shareholders and other stakeholders. That's a very different concept to reverse. So how one deals with that in the context of all the forces we're talking here is an important factor. Because even China, as it grows as an economy, uh, and as it grows internationally as an economy, will have to cope with that. Uh, but the factor that I wanted to touch on finally uh, was this, uh, the rise of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, and the very profound effect that I think it's going to have on 
income distribution and on job distribution in the future. And it is going to call on governments to start to rethink political systems, to start to rethink the fundamental relationship that they have with their voters and with their citizens. Whether you get to universal incomes, whether you get to some other outcome, something different is going to have to take place because of the risk of rapid displacement of labor, which is embedded in the promise of artificial intelligence. because uh, the data here uh, is a little sobering in some ways. So to bring it to the overall conversation, I'm just going to make one point, which is um, uh, the value of what I'll call leadership stories. So Ann and I sit in business schools, as a lot of us do here. But I'm, I'm just, I'd, I'd encourage us all to go back to 1976. Uh, Mao dies. Um, China is one of the poorest countries on the planet. And today's dollars per capita income was maybe $300 a year. It's remarkable how impoverished the country was. Um, and the great and good minds, if we go read the, go back and go in your library archives, uh, uh, the FT and the Economist and the Wall Street Journal, nobody, I think, maybe you were in, in scenario planning, but, but almost, no, almost nobody on the planet was saying, get ready, here comes the world's most amazing growth experience that we've ever seen. And what was really integral to that was the person who succeeded him out, which is Deng Xiaoping. First of all, if we'd had betting online, online betting, nobody would have won the bets saying, Deng's going to succeed Mao as the next leader of China because he w had been outed in the, in, the, in the Cultural Revolution. His son was imprisoned and, and paralyzed. Mao himself was humiliated, or uh, Deng was humiliated in a couple of ways. But Deng came to power. And he'd seen, as a, you know, he, remember, he was a, he was a military compatriot of, of Mao during the, the Civil War. In the 50s and 60s, he'd had administrative positions throughout China. He's the one who saw firsthand, like a lot of others did, the tragedy of the Great Leap Forward and the, and the, the mass starvation that took hold when they tried to mechanize ag and, and just couldn't bring around manufacturing without market forces. And it had the famous quote that in American English is kind of like, I don't care if it's a black cat or a white cat as so long as it catches mice. So my point is, Deng comes to power, and he started to tell a very different leadership story for the country. His first state visit to the United States was in April of 1979. And it's amazing when you look back at the risk he took he made the obligatory visit to the White House, but he wanted to communicate to the world, we need to open to knowledge and technology and build up the capacity to have economic growth. So where he went in the United States, after he went to the White House, um, he went to the Johnson Space Center, because at that time, 1979, if you wanted to say to the world, I'm, I'm interested in technological capabilities and economic growth and innovation, like David rightly pointed out in his remarks, you go to the United States and you go to NASA, because the United States would put somebody on the moon. And then he went to Seattle and Atlanta, and he visited Boeing's headquarters, and he visited Coca-Cola's headquarters. So it was pretty remarkable. If you think about it, too, like the personal risk he took to like go out there and say to the world, these are things that my country is now interested in. And then we've all seen the economic consequence of that, which is the world's most amazing growth experience that we've kind of ever seen, sustainability and scale and all that. In my home country, the United States, and rock star economics is, is, is exactly right. China didn't cause a lot of the disruptions in the United States, but if you look at what, if you look county by county at the electoral path to victory that Donald Trump was able to carve over Secretary Clinton, um, it's pretty remarkable. It was in a handful of counties in states like Pennsylvania and, and Ohio uh, and Wisconsin where he told a more compelling leadership story. Uh, there's about 600 counties that President Obama had won in 2008 and 2012. Uh, Donald Trump flipped 400 of those counties. There were 207 counties that President Obama had carried in either eight or 12, 207. Donald Trump flipped 193 of those counties. And no judgment against Secretary Clinton. I voted for her. Uh, but Secretary Clinton, there was about 2,200 counties that had gone Republican in eight and 12. Uh, Secretary Clinton was able to flip only six of those 2,200 counties. So the current occupant of the White House, whatever you might think of him, got there because he's, he told the story. If you go back and look at his inaugural address, for example, in January 17, it was bleak. It was a story of American people and communities being stolen and ripped off by the global economy, and, and he was going to turn that around. He's trying to do it. So as an optimist, it, it, like the American political system is pretty robust. We got separated of powers. We have elections. We'll, we'll kind of see what happens. Um, but I think I'm struck at how what animates, and, 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 and your point, Jeff, AI was coming, and I talked about talent earlier, it's all about those themes. Americans are quite optimistic, and I've done a lot of research recently with a, 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 some work of, uh, um, we surveyed Americans in a lot of cities that are struggling, and we kind of listened to them, we did a bunch of focus groups, like, well, what do you think is going on? 
And they said, well, th it stinks, per Ann's point, which is right. But what's interesting when you say to them, well, what do you want to do about it? If you give them the options, if you say, do you want to build walls or build bridges? If those are the only two options per Donald Trump getting elected, a lot of people, it's kind of a coin flip. A lot of like, okay, that's my only options. Let's build some walls. But if you say, we can build bridges, but also we can, we can do things to try to help you and your family and your communities. Do you want to have, and so the, the frame we use was, do you want to build bridges and social safety nets or, bri or build bridges and give bladders an opportunity to get up, up on, the, um, on the bridges to kind of do well, to connect more to the world through trade and FDI and immigration? And the modal response in, the, in, the, in all these cities, sorry, the plurality of the majority response is, actually, we like bridges and ladders of opportunity. The reality, for better or worse, on my footnote on Anne, is safety nets, there's such sense of unfairness that it actually permeates a lot of sense that that's not the solution, that those programs are kind of unfair. And the optimism, me, and I'll finish on this, is if you look at public opinion surveys in China in recent years, the same sentiments of concern about job growth, about sustainability, about income inequality and corruption, about the environment, a lot of the same things that animate the citizens of the United States and a lot of other advanced countries with Brexit and stuff, same things that the citizens of China are, are worried about. So I'm struck by, from an American ear, when I hear through the translations, President Xi talking about the Chinese dream, it's the same kind of come back to Adam Smith and others of having an economic system that it has a just framework uh, from the disinterested observer that, that is set up to work and then you let the innovation and the exchange run and you get all this prosperity. In some basic sense, military issues that you raised over aside, we can go back to that. I think the Chinese people have the same aspirations that brought, which is what Deng was able to start to realize and his successors in imperfect ways. But um, I just, there's, I think there's an opportunity to address the anxieties and the frictions that, uh, that you all so articulately put together. In my mind, I'm just, there's, it, it comes back to who's going to tell the right leadership stories that are grounded in some moral sentiment framework that's going to resonate with citizens and right on the public policies. But you've got to have the, those policies you don't just magically get. You gotta get it through the, 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 the democratic process and the policy process or whatever it is in the country. So that's something I'd encourage us to think about in the couple of days we're here in particular. It's like kind of what's the, what do we know from the research of the past of the great minds like Smith and where we are today and what research can we do that's gonna help create that kind of optimism. And you see companies like Salesforce, they're knocking it out of the park, but we need that to be happening at a much greater scale. So yeah, I, I wanna build on what you said and challenge a little bit of what you said, Ed. Uh, and put some numbers behind it. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, uh, we're one of the biggest investors in AI. I drive the AI strategy for the company. So I, I, I'm gonna conclude there in my comment here and what that really means. But let's look at the change in employment in the United States. Just take that as an example. And you could do equivalent numbers for what I'm about to say for every industrialized country. 1950, we had a population of 160 million people. Of that 160 million people, 55 million people were at work, and that is actually 55% of the working age population, 25 to 65. So 55 million people, 20, uh, 1950. 2015, population 330 million people, 153 million people at work. We created 100 million jobs in that period of time. And we had a little bit of technological change along the way. You think about ports, containerization, right? We're gonna eliminate all the stevedores. Many more people work at ports today than ever before because trade expanded. ATMs, gonna eliminate all the tellers. We have many more people working at banks today than ever before. And you can go down that list quite again and again and again. Think about travel. 1950, almost nobody traveled. A few wealthy and a few companies. Very few were even global, let alone national. You think about the travel industry today, rental car companies, hotels, airlines, theme parks. I guarantee you no one in 1950 imagined that in 1975 they would go to work at Euro Disney outside of Paris. Inconceivable. Think about t movies, right, Ni and radio. 1950 television hadn't happened yet. Television's gonna eliminate radio, eliminate movies. Well, it didn't. Many more people work in radio, many more people work in movies, vastly more in television worldwide. So we've created many more jobs driven by innovation, which David talked about at the beginning. So there are, are several issues here, but we haven't touched really on either one of them. Uh, and yes, the, lots of jobs were lost along the way, but the question is, can we re-educate the workforce to participate in the new jobs? And that's what you emphasized. And that's really, I think, a big part of what's going on here, is we have left in the educational system vast numbers of people behind and not able to adapt to the jobs that actually are there and actually help create these new jobs. Uh, I, I think AI is actually a, uh, augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence, making people more capable, able to do things they were unable to do before and work in collaboration with machines. 
You use the example of the Amazon store. We'll actually have to look behind that because, in fact, a bigger example is Target, much bigger employer of, of retail. At Target store today, you, there's a big U.S. retailer, you won't find checkout counters anymore. People just go out. What are the people doing? They're on the floor helping people find things, making suggestions, doing things that human beings do very well, emotional, empathetic, uh, unique skills, unique knowledge. Any machine can do the checkout. So we're seeing a shift to those human-based skills. And now that's the question. Can you take that 60-year-old truck driver and actually give him the skills to relate to other people? Because the truck driver of tomorrow, we're going to have lots of truck drivers, but they're going to be sitting remotely driving them just like a drone pilot today. The skill set for the truck driver of tomorrow is Grand Theft Auto. Uh, and we're already moving there. That's what's happening. We're going to have lots more truck driving, but a different class of truck driver. It's that 60-year-old truck driver who doesn't want to change. That's the real question. And then finally, uh, a number of years ago, I helped write a movie called Minority Report, which some of you will have seen. Uh, we were wrong about two things. Uh, it was not 2050, it was 2020, and it wasn't Washington, D.C., it was Beijing. Uh, that is, Beijing is the world of Minority Report. Hyper-efficient, uh, high surveillance, universally everything works, and rapid technological change. And their vision of what they're becoming is genuinely a vision, and if you ask, people in China, they actually have an optimistic view of their own future, particularly compared to their recent past. So I think there's a very different story and a much more optimistic story, both with respect to China, but our challenge in America is the challenge of adaptation. Can we facilitate the adaptation? Because we're really good at creating the jobs, we're just not as good at taking people with us. And I really have to be impressed. Uh, this is a man who went from working from an old world oil company to a new world technology company and along the way started a magazine focused on new technologies and wrote a movie that's far future. So I'm curious to see what you do in the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> with that as a background, I just wanted to pick up and I agree with um, everything he just said, uh, although I do think there will be more crossovers between augmented intelligence and artificial intelligence which will create their own set of challenges in the future. Uh, the beauty of the American system, the beauty of an open market system is its adaptive capabilities. And people do find new things to do. Can we educate them well enough to do that? Uh, I'd come back to something Matt said in the uh, analysis of the, uh, of the uh, last presidential election, because I think that's at the core of this issue, which is how do you create and build a strong middle class? Uh, because on a middle class, you have a thriving economy. On a middle class, you have a thriving democracy. Uh, and that's what I think is um, the challenge that's facing us as much as globalization today, if not more so. Uh, you see it in the United States. I think Donald Trump won not just because of China. He won because of Mexico and immigration. He won because people felt that uh, the elites had ignored them in favor of too many others for too long and hadn't taken their concerns adequately into account in the formulation and implementation of policies. They were being told that X and Y were good for them, when in fact, maybe on a macro level they were, but on a micro level, they were challenged to find the reasons that they were. It's a phenomenon that happened in the United States election. It's the Brexit phenomenon. It's the Gilets Jaunes phenomenon in France. It's the uh, phenomenon that you see in a number of other European countries. Curiously, it is not yet a phenomenon with the possible exception, and you can debate it, of Hong Kong. Uh, it's not yet an accept a phenomenon which you see happening in Asia more broadly. Whether it will happen more broadly in Asia if China can't deliver on its growth promises to the middle class remains to be seen. That is probably somewhere in the future. That's a discussion for a different forum. Uh, but I think until we appreciate that a lot of what we think as leaders, leaders of educational institutions, leaders of political institutions, leaders of corporate institutions, the more people think about how do you build strong middle classes, the better off these challenges are likely to be addressed. Well, let me just uh, jump in. I, I mean, I think there is a real question whether the arrival of a middle class is ipso facto a democratizing force. Uh, that was the great promise in China, and it is not materialized. If anything, the middle class in China is very conservative. They have something to protect now. Sure. 
Um, now, listen, I want to uh, just remind everybody that the subject of this discussion is not whether, yes, we need to invest in our economy, yes, we need to build infrastructure, invest in education, and all of the things we know too well. But we are here to deliberate on the question of is the world disaggregating? Are the structures which we have relied upon over the past half a century, are they threatened? And if they are, who, who's threatening who and what's the remedy? So, uh, Anne. Yes, so the world is definitely disaggregating. I mean, uh, it, in other presentations, I actually show the drop in trade. Um, there, there's no question that, th that, that the world is disaggregating. But the interesting question is why? Because if you get the cause wrong, you're really going in a very bad direction, which is really bad for the world economy. And I just want to say, getting back to this issue of education, um, so I went and I visited Microsoft and I met with the head of, of AI at Amazon and, and I said to these people, I said, well, okay, so you're getting rid of jobs, you know, basically now if you go to an Amazon warehouse, there are miles and miles and miles of all those boxes you receive on your for, uh, doorstep. But it's not people who are moving those around, it's robots, right? So I said to them, I said, well, what are you doing about jobs? And they said, don't worry about the jobs, they said to me, because what this means is that instead of having those really boring jobs where nobody gets to think, in the future we're gonna have really high quality jobs, okay? So that's the response. And I sit there and I think, okay, in America only a third of the population actually goes to college. I think the, the, the future they are showing us is a future that is better suited to the China model than the, to the US model. Because in China, everybody's investing in education. Investment is 50% of GDP. Everyone wants to go to college. That's not happening in the United States. The US is going to be much less capable of having people take on those quality jobs than the Chinese and you know, people in Vietnam. So that is my big concern. And that is why it's so important to understand, yes, the world is disaggregating, but the reasons, the underlying reasons is because we are not investing in our people. Not because there's such unfair trade and we should hit back with tariffs. I think the question actually, Anne, is not simply one of jobs and trade. It is a question of a relationship between the two largest economies in the world that is not reciprocal. Not reciprocal. It is not a level playing field. It is not fair. And it, it, has, it has a lot of inequities that need to be ironed out if it's going to be functional in the future. Can I just say something about yeah. that? So I'm, I'm actually a, um, a trade economist and um, my first job out of graduate school was actually to go to the World Bank where I worked with Larry Summers to write a chapter on trade in the process, in growth in the world. And I looked at hundreds of years of trade policy and this is the right place to be thinking about that. Um, and here's the interesting evidence which requires us going back many, many decades. The U.S. over 200 years grew through tariff barriers. We had average of 40% tariffs until 1945. In 1945, we had decided we had done well, and therefore we wanted to open up other country markets so we could export our stuff there. So we changed the rules of the game, okay? So now the rules of the game are being changed on us, and we're like, this is not fair. How can you do this to us, you know? I mean, we have to look over the last several hundred years. Remember, China was forced to open up so we could sell them opium 300 years ago. Am I making this up? No. no. Well, well, wait a minute. The we is the British, not the Americans. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wait, wait. But, but Ian, we, look, I, I actually did the China strategy for our company. As I've done the India strategy, the Brazil strategy, the European strategy, et cetera. Did the same, my last big project at Shell was trying to get a big refinery built in China. We did our usual 10 banquets and we failed. Uh, having said that, we have had to adapt to the rules of the game in China that we find essentially unacceptable. But we have no choice. Either we're there or we're not. 
and our customers are there, we have to serve our customers, and we've had to do things that we would not do anywhere else in the world, and they're non-tariff issues. They're issues of things like intellectual property, et cetera. Uh, and so the, the divisions and the fragmentation that Orville is talking about and that we all agree is happening is in part driven by, I think, a very different philosophy of what the role of a society is, what the role of a government is, what, how you lead and govern your countries. And so I think the US and China have very different views of what constitute appropriate behavior, and that fragmentation is very real. And by the way, I think there are very different views as in Europe, obviously. So uh, the, the, the question of fragmentation, I think, is an increasingly ubiquitous one. And it is the, I think, internal failures and the shared lack of a shared vision of what a collective order actually means. I mean, we may end up with a bifurcated collective order like the Cold War, where we have globalization amongst one group of countries. And we have like a common turn, com con. Uh, we have another trading partnership between Russia and North Korea. China, the Philippines, and a few others. So, I mean, uh, that is a, is a massive reformatting, though, of the things as they are now. All right, listen, uh, we could go. That, that won't be able to sustain Chinese growth unless you really well, have much a, more of a domestic economy. There may be some and other right think, tail, too. And I think some of the disaggregation that you describe, which is accurate, is a consequence of, in democratic societies, the loss of middle class support for the international institutions that were supposed to serve them so well. Brexit being a very specific example. Yeah. We have a version uh, of it happening uh, in each of our countries. Correct. All right, uh, we have uh, 23 minutes and 34 seconds for you all to ask questions, so let's start with you. Yeah, I'm Joanna Shelton, I'm former Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, I'm now at the University of Montana. <clears throat> and. Uh, there's so much thrown out today that it, uh, I just have a couple of, of comments. Uh, one, I think I agree with Ann uh, Harrison on that the pain is real, and that's where I think that perhaps Peter Schwartz, where you talk about we need new leadership stories. Deng Xiaoping wasn't just a leadership story. I mean, he freed up the agricultural sector and agricultural production skyrocketed, did the same thing by creating private sector behavior, um, and that's what changed it. Um, also. Donald Trump won these counties not because he told a different story, but basically he capitalized on the real pain, the real loss of jobs that had occurred, particularly in the manufacturing base. And I think that's where, with Ann Slaughter, I too have done a lot of work in trade and investment. Um, I was teaching a course where I was looking at, at the, uh, <laughs> when China joined the WTO, December 2001, and you look at the slow decline in US manufacturing employment from the 1950s on down, as in most OECD countries, other than Germany, which has subsidized manufacturing jobs. But <clears throat> you looked at a pretty steadward, steady downward trend. But then in 2001, 2002, you saw a tremendous upswing in US foreign direct investment, particularly manufacturing into China, so that you know, the, the line goes up. And that really accelerated dramatically the decline in US manufacturing employment. So, <clears throat> excuse me. While it is true that technological change is a big driver and probably the more substantial driver, and I do agree that China is not the primary cause of our problems, I think a lot of them are internally uh, driven, I do think there's no doubt that the China, given its, say, it's just its size alone, has had a big impact. Last comment I would make is I think in terms of the response, I think that's something that we will need to be discussing during the next two days, but I think the ones that, Anne, that you had, had laid out, or and others, um, a universal income, or of course trade adjustment assistance. This is, TAA has been the, the uh, response for decades, um, not very successful one. But I think these are all band-aids. Um, we're looking, I think, and I, this is where I would agree with uh, Ms. Rothschild, that I think we need a real fundamental relook at how we're driving our internal policies in the United States and other advanced economies to deal with what I think is a unique and growing challenge from China. I think it's difficult to decouple. I don't know what the answers are, but we need more than universal incomes. We talk about psychology and moral sentiment. Psychologists will tell you that work is a very, very important aspect of human self-esteem, 
and happiness. And we can't forget that. Just receiving money does not create the kind of society I think that we want. Thank you. Thank you, I'm Harry Broadman. Um, I, you know, I think clearly we probably all agree that, that globalization is disaggregating, but to answer your challenge, Orville, is sort of what's the solution? Um, you know, the fact is that the two largest economies of the world are now operating outside of the WTO, okay? So I'm, I'm actually drawn to one hypothesis that we may end up with some kind of bifurcated or trifurcated, you know, trading system at least. But I, I guess the, the real question is, where is the leadership going to come from? It's certainly not going to come from the United States under this administration. Because I think you know, a, a, a goods were sold without any money behind it. So there's no money on the table for investment in infrastructure, education, and the like. Um, but I, I'm, I'm frankly very pessimistic because I'm at a loss to understand where is the global leadership going to come from. And I, I, think the, I think what is going to produce some kind of solution, in quotes, is going to be some sort of a crisis of some sort. Whether it's a war, I don't know. But I, I would say to the notion that this is going to sort of solve itself uh, in the short term, I, my own view is I think that that is quite, quite fanciful. So I, I, you know, I just, I think, you know, if we want to get practical at this conference at some point is begin to think, so what needs to happen to get from A to B? Um, and it's not obvious to me what, what that path is. Yeah, and if I could just quick, my quick comment to that. Part of the answer to what you say depends upon whether you see a Trump administration lasting another two years or another six years. But you know, you, we also have to ask the question that even if we solve the trade war, would that restabilize the relationship between the U.S. and China and thus the global sort of economic order? I think it, the, the, the problem has now metastasized so far beyond trade that it would be an epiphenomenon. Um, I, I think I would think more like Peter uh, if, if I was choosing, but I, I would agree with everybody who spoke. Um, I, I wonder if one of the challenges that we have here is that we're, we're trying to address a problem that's too large. And effectively, if we looked at it in kind of a more princ first principles approach, we actually have two broken systems bashing against each other. Uh, the, the Western uh, economic system is inherently broken, uh, lack of social justice, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got the, uh, the totalitarian, uh, too much uh, China system, which is also a system that's in imbalance. And perhaps the best way to solve the problem isn't to try to get your neighbor to stop beating his wife, but just to improve the way you treat your own family. And so I wonder if part of the solution here is really revolving around the issue of uh, the income inequality in the US, where if if we could solve that and make the average American wealthier, because I think we've, we would all agree that the middle class is really the, the method of, of creating opportunity, if economics is the study of transactions, give more people more money and they'll be able to transact more. And then perhaps we can potentially start looking at how we stabilize the West so that it's better able to weather China. And then we don't have to worry about China as much. So how do you all reply to that? He's asking the question, it seems to me, are we externalizing the problem when the real problem is more internal? Look, I think it's a both and. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't think you can get to a collective solution until you ta ta tackle the internal issues in both countries. Uh, but I can only speak most directly about the U.S., and I think our issues are fairly obvious. I think China, I, I'm not sure what the right answer for China is, to be honest, uh, what, how they should govern themselves, how they should organize themselves, et cetera. So I, I don't have an answer for that, but it is clear to me that uh, I think you're right. If we, if we can't fix ourselves, there's no likelihood of achieving a higher order consensus, I think. Uh, the kind of unified, I uh, say, self-vision, and unified is perhaps too strong a word, uh, in the post-World War II immediate uh, aftermath, there was a degree of consensus, not universal by any means, and the means to enforce it. Uh, now there's neither consensus nor the means to enforce it. And I think that's part of the issue is that we don't have the, 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 the fora, the uh, places where these come together in ways that you can actually achieve something, the equivalent of Bretton Woods, for example. 
it's almost impossible to imagine that taking place today. Any other thoughts? I'd say the magnitude for at least, if you look inside the, um, the insights of, sorry, I can't remember your name from Montana, and Stuart, I just, yeah, both of you. The mag realistically, the magnitude of public policy investments needed uh, are orders of magnitude more than what the, the political discourse has had. Trade adjustment assessments, no disrespect <laughs> against the good civil servants that do that program. It's, it's so inadequate and poorly designed relative to the scope of what we're talking about. To get more Peters to have that kind of mobility that you point out, I mean, that's why I come back to it. it, it it's, there's all this research now that shows how many words a child hears before the age of five is shockingly predictive about all sorts of long-term health, economic, social outcomes. So like, when you think about that mindset, to, it's like, a, what's the Marshall Plan for the United States that starts from age zero, that addresses the median voter in Ohio, that frankly at some point is gonna have to say, and for some of you, I, there's nothing we're gonna be able to do. So regardless of which Democratic candidate you might look at, the magnitudes they're talking about of hundreds of billions of dollars a year and trillions of dollars across a 10-year fiscal window are accurate if you're meaningfully going to address the pressures that Ann artic articulated. I don't so, like it. It's, oh. it's, yeah. uh, Michael Jacobides, London Business School. A uh, couple of things first. In terms of the technological disruption, I think that the magnitude that we're speaking about is not uh, similar to the one that we had from the 50s today, especially in terms of AI and the thinning of the middle classes. And I think that this is extremely important, especially for people in this room who are in education that starts failing to be able to deliver on the promise precisely because a number of the things that people are trained in uh, ed higher education institutions are starting to be automated and that is leading to the concerns that we have. The previous historical example that we can think of is probably uh, what happened a couple of centuries ago, not far after the time of Adam Smith. At that stage, we had the Luddites. Luddites went out breaking these new tools of production. The difference is Luddites didn't vote because they did not own land. People now vote, and that is what is leading to a facile uh, anger that can find itself in terms of the trade dynamics, because obviously demonizing the people that are in the other block is an easy solution. So beyond demonizing, the question is, and we are going to have a push for nationalism that has to do with the political dynamics of people losing their jobs, livelihoods, and promise to enter the middle class, where are we? Two things. We used to have the problem of China shielding competition and not being right in terms of the IP. I think we've moved beyond that, though. And I'm a little concerned uh, hearing uh, the chairman saying, well, the problem is, what will they do? And will they leave you out to hang dry in terms of not servicing the equipment? Which seems like a, a rather unusual argument. Uh, it seems also that it is hard to uh, isolate uh, the fact that right now the United States does not have a firm that is able to compete with Huawei on 5G at price points that are similar. So it is very difficult to isolate the element of old style traditional protectionism in terms of uh, pushing back in terms of some of the competitors. So the question is, where are we? Well, part of the where we are is that things that are moving now in China are moving because the Chinese system, which does not take individual liberty particularly seriously, is well suited for applying many of these information technologies. And that is a final societal choice that we make. Europe has GDPR, makes everyone's life terribly difficult. Uh, the US may move to something that will take the, what's happening right now in California uh, in a uh, country level. We'll see what exactly happens sometime this year. But this fundamentally uh, affects the ability of companies to engage in some of these new business models. WeChat would not be possible in Europe because of GDPR and because of the way that we are organized. So there's a broader question here, individual freedom versus growth and the possibility of leveraging and applying AI recognition, usage of data in application and different business models. And I think that casting it into a these people who do not respect the world order may be undermining our ability to understand what the problem is, diagnose it, and as such address the particular angles. And we may want to move beyond the traditional framing of the problem as has been proposed. Uh, with this a panel of Americans, right? I, I, unfortunately, in some sense, uh, Europe is not represented at this uh, uh, up here. Uh, Europe seems to be fragmented. Well, I have EU citizenship. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you know what, I, what I'm what I'm trying to suggest is to, to pick up on your comment: Is Europe going to play a 
another role in this world? Uh, is it now terribly involuted? There's no United States of Europe. There was a kind of unifying vision, first with the EU, then the Euro, and so on. And now that's really under great stress. Uh, is Europe a non-actor in this story? Uh, it, does Europe play a role in creating a new global system, or is it now completely lost to its own trials? Europeans? gentleman here has a, a, a responsibility. Yes, in the back? Yeah, uh, well, actually, uh, actually, I have a question for the panel as opposed to my views. You all seem very clear about what the problems are and what the answers are, and I, and I sort of assume that the West will sort of muddle through, get some things right, some things wrong. I, I assume that. The one organization that's got the power and the will at the moment to do things over the long term is the Chinese Communist Party. I'm interested to know what the panel thinks about how the Chinese Communist Party will develop and plan its strategy over the next 25 to 50 years. I, I defer to Orville. Yeah, that's <laughs> well, that's a whole other day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese Communist Party is excellent at planning. And one of the reasons they can plan with such a plume is because they don't have the threat of their leader changing every four years. And in the case of Xi Jinping, he may not even change every 10 years. So he can actually follow through on a plan. I think the real question that, that uh, we in the West need to answer is, yes, the Chinese are well organized. Yes, they have a lot of capital. Yes, they have the Belt and Road and they're expanding all over the world. The question that I find myself unable to answer, but I confront it with some trepidation is, is this the kind of new world order in which I want to live? And I think my answer to that is, I mean, I've spent decades in and out of China, and it's an emphatic no. So that's why I think when we start talking about you know, economies and who's going to do better and worse and, and, you know, and, and technology, as if it's just kind of a neutral thing we can all share. That was the old world of two years ago. And we are in a new world, it seems to me, just arrived within the last couple of years as China has changed its very pretension of what it wants to do in the world, of what its system is, and whether that is a system it, it imagines is one that it would like to see expand out abroad. Believe me, when, China, when Huawei goes to Tanzania or, or wherever it goes in Africa, it isn't just selling cell phone platforms and cell phone systems. You're going to get the whole surveillance system going in. And, and, the, and, and there are a lot of countries that really want this. So this is why I think it's, we have moved way beyond trade, way beyond economics way beyond whether a country can deliver to create wealth and bring the middle class up. I mean, all of those things are good, but we have entered this new world where there are other currencies that we're, we have to uh, trade in. Are there any other pa panelists? Thank, thank okay. you so much. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sharon Alvarez. I'm with the University of Pittsburgh, and I'd like to pick up on a couple of points, not quite so worldly points. I'd like to maybe bring them back to something I call the dignity of work. And that is, as we begin to think through these issues and the implications for people who are being displaced, we remember that it is not just their social, psychological well-being, but work is important for entire communities. It's important for families. It's important for the communities. Um, my father did not have a college education, but he worked for a company um, called Safeway when I was growing up. And they were very, very supportive of the families and the communities that they were in. They paid for my health care. They paid for some of my college tuition. They're just very supportive. And because of that, you see families are able to move on and do better and perhaps reach different, different levels of education or, or perhaps even work attainment. So it's not always just a college education. Maybe it's a, it's a new type of trade education. But I, I, I fear when, when sometimes I hear us talking about what about work and what about the displaced, 
that we forget that there is dignity to, to the human being, to the family, and to the community, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Now, this isn't a problem caused by China uh, in I, any of our countries. Any comments from uh, 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 my colleagues? I agree. Yeah. I agree. Okay. Um, right here. Uh, well, here, and, and we'll have you next. Hello, I'm Richard Williams, and Vice Chancellor of Harriet Watts University. Um, I'm going to um, answer your European question in a slightly different way. And my question to the panel is that um, I'm going to use some words that describe what I think is on the minds of younger people in Europe. And I wonder if these are the same words on the minds of younger people in USA. And is this a further example of disaggregation or not? Um, the words I hear on the minds of younger people in Europe are the climate change challenge, um, the need to address global poverty, the need to ensure fair corporate taxation, and the right and benefits of global education. These are the things that uh, are very, very strong in the ears of younger people uh, in the UK and uh, all across Europe. And I just wondered, is there any place for this in the dialogue that we have today? Because some of these issues haven't been raised. Thank you. Well, I, I, we have a 28-year-old son who would use every word you've just described in the United States. But he's just moved to Beijing for his job. Uh, <laughs> uh, he is now a game writer in Beijing as of this last weekend, because that's where the opportunity is from his point of view. Uh, so. From the, they are highly mobile, uh, but those concerns that which you've articulated are, I think, widely shared. You would hear the same thing in Singapore. You'd hear the same thing in Australia. You, I don't know, and I'd ask Orville whether you'd hear the same thing in China. You know, tragically, I think one of the, the, the issues that you raised that used to be the cement between China and Europe and America was climate change. And then along came Donald Trump and pulled the keystone of the collaborative part of the relationship out. Not only did we lose on climate change, we lost that common purpose with China. So there's no common purpose with China now, which makes it a lot easier just to feud over the things we disagree on. So that is indeed a tragedy, and it doesn't address the issues that the younger generation cares about. Um, but there we are. OK, uh, Anne, quickly. Uh, um, yes. Uh, Oh, yeah. No, I, I just wanted to say um, th this is a shameless plug for, for Berkeley Haas. Um, we, we have the lowest endowment of any top business school. Um, this, we're a state school. We create the biggest mobility in terms of going from the bottom 20% of the population to the top 1% in the United States. Um, but the state won't give us money. Um, and, and so we somehow figure out how to make things work. What's interesting to me is we've managed to succeed and stay in among the top six schools because we're essentially selling a mission, which is the mission of core deep values. And what we're saying is you come here because you want to go beyond yourself, because you care about climate change, because you care about inequality, because those are the things that are really motivating you because you want to make the world a better place. And there is a huge response. That is why students are coming to business school, of all places, because they want to change the world. At our commencement for our full-time MBA program, every student speaker was doing something that I can't believe it was nonprofit. Patrick, Patrick Awua created the Sheshi University in Ghana to create ethical students. Um, the, the commencement speaker for our full-time MBA program is creating a um, farm to table enter enterprise in New York City. And the third commencement speaker is creating a K through 12 school in um, the East Bay. I mean, there are very passionate students out there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an opportunity to, to harness them and do some good. Okay, we have time for one quick question and quick answer. Do you have a quick question? I'll try. Um, so, Alan Webb, Editor-in-Chief of the McKinsey Quarterly. Uh, in 2005, we published an article called Don't Blame Trade for U.S. Job Losses that made exactly the same article that Ann uh, made. And I, in ret with the benefit of hindsight, I think it was exactly right and entirely irrelevant. And my question for the panel is, what underlying ideas might we have today 
that are similarly not serving as well in the context of the challenges to global, uh, global aggregation and disaggregation? Let's just rip down the line and short comments from us all. Changed nature of healthcare itself. Uh, we have to really rethink fundamentally what healthcare is, and we in the United States haven't even begun that conversation. Uh, uh, great question. I would just say again that um, I like the question. Young, uh, we're all kind of old in this room. Uh, I think I think the optimism that's present among MBA candidates at all schools, and like, but harnessing that in a way that speaks to it's not just the MBA candidates. It's what are we going to do for the kids that don't have the means to go to college even, get through high school. Invest in human and physical capital. Uh, in order, taking that in order to deal with technological disruption. All right, thanks for coming uh, and sharing your thoughts with us.